I want to begin this morning by just kind of sharing with you a story about who I think is one of the most fascinating, um, mysterious people of our generation, and, and possibly, probably someone that you've never heard of, Charles Feeney. Charles Feeney um, was a guy that was born in, in 1930s in New Jersey, a uh, child of Irish immigrants, grew up in the midst of the Great Depression. So he saw the impact that poverty has on the people around him. Um, when he was 10 years old, he started shoveling uh, snow to make money and selling Christmas cars door to door to help support his family. But in the 1960s, he stumbled on a business idea that made him very, very wealthy. He established um, the duty-free shops that you find in most international airports. And he became very, very, very wealthy very quickly. And he was faced with this question of, that all people who become rich have to decide. What do I do with all this extra? What do I do with all this money? And from the beginning, he was very uncomfortable seeing it as all being at his own disposal. And so from the very beginning, he decided that he was going to give away about 99% of everything he made and put it into a foundation and give it away. The only condition as he gave the money away was that he would remain anonymous. And all during the 80s and 90s, these organizations all over the world were getting these huge cashier checks and they didn't know where they were coming from. And everyone was trying to figure out where is all this money coming from. But it remained a mystery until 1998 when in a business deal he had to legally disclose what he had been doing. And all of a sudden it was discovered that this guy Charles Feeney had given all this money away and was continuing to do so. At the time, Fortune magazine had him as one of the 400 most wealthy Americans. But even then they only knew about 1% of his wealth because he had given 99% of it away. <laughs> All the while, he was living incredibly frugally. He flew coach. They, people said he kind of dressed shabby. He had a $5 watch. He didn't own a house. He didn't own a car. Still doesn't own a house to this day. Over the years, he has given away so much money and impacted so many millions of lives. But more than that, he has also, since coming out in 1998, that he is actually the benefactor, he's influenced other billionaires to also give their fortunes away. People like Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg. He has, um, just this last year, his foundation gave away the last of their money. He's now in his late 80s. He's still alive. They gave away the last of their money. A total of $8 billion has been given away. And he has kept, his net worth is now $2 million as he is in his late 80s. And you're like, wow, $2 million, that's a lot of money. I know a lot of people that retire on more than $2 million that never gave $8 billion away. That's a, a remarkable story and a remarkable man. You may say, well, what in the world would motivate him to do that? Why would he live that way? Well, if you go to the website of the foundation, his foundation, he has this quote. And he says this, I believe strongly in giving while living. I see little reason to delay giving when so much good can be achieved through supporting worthwhile causes today. Besides, it's a lot more fun to give while you live than to give while you're dead. It's a lot more fun to give while you live than to give while you're dead. And that is a story that Jesus told as a point that he taught 2,000 years ago. It's a lot more fun to give while you live than to give while you're dead. You know, all summer long we've been in the series on the parables of Jesus. Jesus' favorite way to teach was through a parable. He would tell these stories that had these eternal truths linked to them. And if you understood and unlocked the parable, you would kind of get to this truth about who God is or who we are, how we're supposed to live or what it's like to be in his kingdom or what his kingdom is like. And he also talked a great deal about money through his parables. Now, talking about money in parables is really a wise thing to do because when you start talking about money, most people get a little sensitive and a little defensive. And if you're here today and you're one of those people, maybe you would consider yourself to be a Christian. Maybe you're not a Christian. You think, oh, you know, churches shouldn't go there. You know, parables are good. Because what would happen is, is that Jesus would tell this story about money and everybody, be, you know, this, people would enter into the story and they would get the lesson. They'd be like right on. And then they'd be walking home and they'd be like, whoa, wait a minute. I think he was talking about me, Right? So today we're going to be looking at this, this principle again, and we've talked about this. We talk about this a couple times a year during New Day, and if we're going to live in our culture, this is something we need to be continually reminded of, this truth that Jesus will make today through the parable of the rich fool. We're going to look at this. It's found in Luke chapter 12, and as we unpack it, I think you're going to see what it's talking about, and let's just pray that you don't, like, as you're going home today, be like, oh, wow, I think he's talking about me. Might happen, I don't know, but we'll see. Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 13. I'm going to read through it, and then we'll kind of come back and, and unpack it. 
Luke 12, beginning in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not contain in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whomever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. Wow. So the parable begins by giving kind of the context of what was happening in, uh, that would lead Jesus to this parable. And it says that uh, this, this guy in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Uh, apparently this, this young man had heard Jesus teaching. He was convicted that Jesus would be a, a fair judge to kind of mediate the issue that he was having with his brother that had to do with an inheritance that they were waiting to receive. And Jesus' response may seem a bit odd, maybe a bit insensitive as you read it the first time. But Jesus says, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Like, okay, Jesus, time out. What what are you saying there? Why are you saying that? Well, and again, it, it does seem insensitive. Yet in matters of like civil affairs and judicial issues, Jesus never really seemed to get involved. You know, he, he would have done a great job at it. Jesus would have been a great judge. He would have been a great attorney. He would have been just as good at those things as he was as a, as a physician. He could have easily solved people's legal disputes as he, ha- he did kind of fix their bodies. But it doesn't seem like that's why he came. He didn't come to like kind of judge between people's legal issues. He came more for issues of the heart. And as he looked at this particular issue, he's probably thinking, you know what, I'm not going to get in the middle of your dispute with your brother. Because I don't really care what your brother's doing. What I care about right now is what's happening in your heart and what's leading to this issue. And so rather than solve your issue, let's deal with what's happening in your heart right now. And then Jesus addresses the whole crowd and kind of identifies what's happening in this young man's heart. And he says, the issue isn't fairness. The issue is greed. And that's why he says very next, he says, watch out, exclamation mark. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A person's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So Jesus warns the crowd, warns us, watch out, be on your guard. Against what? Against greed. Why do I need to be on my guard? Against greed. Because most of us are greedy. Most of us are greedy, and we don't even know we're greedy because greed is one of those things that's very hard to see in ourselves. I would imagine that as Jesus said, you know, watch out. Don't let possessions get the best of you. Don't let your possessions own you. Life doesn't consist in what you own. It's it's not about that. That the crowd that was listening to him was probably, yes, Jesus. Amen, Jesus. You preach it, Jesus. You're right, Jesus. Life doesn't consist of what you, we own. Greed is a dead-end road. And they would be uh, amening him and, and, and agreeing with him because no one would have identified as being greedy. That's somebody, we can see it in somebody else, but we can't see it in ourselves. Well, that person's greedy, but I'm not, I'm not greedy. And why is it so hard to see it in ourselves? One reason it's hard to see greed in ourselves is because we don't judge ourselves based on our actions. We judge ourselves based on our intentions. We judge other people based on their actions. Well, you're greedy because, you know, you don't give anything away. I mean, you kind of hoard and you're kind of, you know, take things for yourself. But me, I'm not greedy. I'm not greedy because I intend to be generous. I mean, do you remember that $5 I gave away to that homeless guy like, what was that, 12 years ago? You know, I, I, I intend to, to really be generous. I intend to give to people in need around me. I intend to live this generous life. Am I doing it now? No, but I'm going to get there. I've got some things to take care of right now. A couple more things to accumulate. My finances to get in order over here. I've got to pay off this debt right now. But then I'm going to be generous. We judge ourselves based on our intentions. Therefore, we do not feel as though we are greedy. And knowing our hearts and how easy it is to kind of deceive ourselves 
And not see greed in ourselves. Jesus tells a story that kind of illuminates what it looks like, and a lot of people can see themselves in the story. And he begins this story, this parable, by saying this, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. So the story begins with really good news, right? This rich guy is getting richer. This, this rich guy who's already got full barns and, and, and huge crops is blessed by God, and he gets even more rich. The rich get richer. And so before we kind of shake our hand at this rich guy who gets richer, let's just stop and let's make sure that we define what it means to be rich. Because rich is a very relative term, right? It occurred to me recently, you know, remember the interaction that Jesus had with the rich young ruler? 2,000 years ago, this guy comes to him, he's rich, and, and Jesus told him to sell his possession and give to the poor because money was getting in the way of, of his relationship with God. But it kind of occurs to me, that guy, that rich young ruler, he couldn't ride in a car, couldn't ride in a plane, fly in a plane, he couldn't have surgery, couldn't buy an antibiotic, he, he can't watch television or listen to recorded music, he can't sleep on a memory foam bed. I mean, think of all the things that that guy can't do. He can't navigate the streets of the city using Google Maps on his smartphone. I mean, if that guy was rich, what am I? Rich is a relative term. And if you've been around New Day for any period of time, you know that we tend to self-identify as rich people. We know we're rich because we know where we stand in the global spectrum of things. That if you make $25,000 a year or more, $25,000 a year, you're in the top 5% of wage earners in the world. You make 18 times the, the, the global average income. That if you make $55,000 a year, you don't feel rich. You feel financially stressed out, probably. But if we were to put you in a room with 100 people from around the world and say the richest person needs to stand up right now, you would be the one standing up. Because if you make $55,000 a year, you're in the top 1% of wage earners in the world. You make 40 times the global uh, average salary. So chances are, if you're here, you're probably rich. Or think about this definition of rich. Having more than I need. Okay. But what, is, what do I need, right? That's where we start to kind of get down to what, I mean, these definitions are kind of confusing. Well, what do, what do we need? I love what Paul said to, to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 8. He says, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. You're like, what? No, 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 no. Can you imagine living a life where you would be content with just enough food and clothing? And you'd say, no way can I imagine that. Why? Because you're rich. Because we have grown to expect much more than just food and clothing and being content with that. But much of the world would be very content just with a steady supply of food and clothing. So this rich guy in Jesus' story is blessed with more, just like a lot of rich people in this room have been blessed with more than they need. And so it says in verse 17, he thought to himself, here comes our rich person problem. These are the kind of problems rich people have. What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Can you feel his pain? Can you see the dilemma that he is in? He is a rich guy and he has so much he doesn't know what to do with it. What do I do with it? Where do I put it? Ah, he's pulling out his hair. And again, maybe you can kind of relate to his problem. What do I do with my excess? This is a rich person problem. I've got more cars that I can fit in my three-car garage. What do I do? Or I've got more stuff in my garage, so I can't get my cars in my garage. What do I do? My basement is full of my stuff, and now it's full to overflowing. What do I do? I need a bigger walk-in closet because I can't get another pair of shoes in my closet. What am I going to do? I've got this big RV. I don't know where to park it. What am I going to do? I have extra income. How am I going to invest it? What am I going to do? Rich people problems. Well, this guy asks himself the question, and the question really is, you know, what am I going to do with my extra? And this is really the question, isn't it? I mean, this is the question that he is, is faced with. It's a question with, that every rich person is, is faced with. And really, this is the point. How he answers this question will determine whether he lives as a wise person or a fool. What do I do 
with my extra? And really behind this question is an even more important question that we have to ask. Who is the extra intended for? If you ever find yourself asking that, why has God blessed me with more than I need? What is the point? See, the essence of greed is believing that everything God gives me, everything God blesses me with, is for my consumption. That if God blesses me with 10, all 10 are for me. If he gives me 100, that's great because now I have 100. God gave it to me, or I earned it. Therefore, it must be for my consumption. Everything I have is for me and my use. And that is exactly what this rich man thought. Everything I have is for me. This is the essence of greed. And so what does he do? Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. I don't know if you see the contradiction in what he's saying. A moment ago, he said, I have no place to store my crops. And now he says, I'm going to tear down my barns. Wait a minute, I thought you had no place to store your, your, your crops. No, no, I have barns, but they're full. That's what made me wealthy. That's why I'm wealthy right now. My barn is already full. All the barns I have, they're full, but they're now insufficient to hold everything that I now have. Therefore, I need to tear them down and build bigger ones. And this is the temptation to everyone who has more than they need, to everyone who has excess, is that the thing that was once sufficient and had me content is no longer sufficient. The barns that made me wealthy are not large enough anymore. I need bigger ones because God has blessed me with more. The house that I've always been content in, I'm no longer content because I have a raise. I got the bonus. Now I can afford more. Therefore, I have to go from the three-bedroom to the five-bedroom. The car that I've always driven, that I've been content with, is no longer good enough because now I can afford a better car. Therefore, I need to get a better car. That's what's happening for this man, and that is what is a temptation to happen to us as well. He says, I will tear down the barns that have always been big enough, the barns that have always kind of stored enough, the, the barns that have always been sufficient so that I can have more for me. And this raises a question that is so relevant for us today. About how we will relate to income and how we will relate to what we have. And really, I, I see that there's three options. Um, and, and all of us fall into one of these three options. Maybe we make a decision into one of these, but for most of us, we just kind of end up falling into one of these. And the first option that we have is that we will live below our income. And this is radically counterculture, but that I will live on and spend on me less than what I make, a percentage perhaps, on less than what I make, so that I can give a part of what I have to others. The second way we can live is that we can live at our income, which means that if I take $100 in, I'm going to spend $100 on me. I'm going to live at my income. But every dollar that I make will be spent on me. Or the third option is we could live above our income. That we could actually, if I make a dollar, I'm actually going to spend a dollar ten. I'm going to go deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. Now, you may be aware, but over half of uh, the people in our nation live in the bottom two categories. Depending on what survey you listen to right now in 2017, 2018, about 50 to 60 percent of all Americans either spend all of or more than their income every month. And it's pretty clear, to, if, you, if you read the Bible, that is not God's plan for us. God does not want us to live above our means, certainly. He doesn't want us to live at our means, which is why he uh, tells us all through Scripture about this thing called tithe, you know, this percentage giving, that we would take at least a tenth of, of what he gives us, and we would set it aside and say, you know what, that's not for my use. It is for, for kingdom use, and that I would live on 90%, and then he also talks about offerings over and above the tithe, so maybe I'm going to live on 85 or 80 or 75%, but some percentage less than what I earn so that I can give other, other uh, wealth away or resources away, not only to bless the people around me and expand kingdom work, but also so that I could be constantly reminded that God is the source of all of it, and he blesses me with it, and he blesses me with it so I could be a channel of blessing to others. So this is not the viewpoint of the rich fool. Rather than existing as a, as a kind of a, a conduit of blessing for others, um, he saw all, everything that he had for, for himself. And so he says, it's time to build bigger barns. Right? This is what I'll do, the man said. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I'll store all my grain and all my goods, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. 
eat, drink, and be merry. Now, if we were hearing this story and we weren't in church talking about a parable called the parable of the rich fool, we would probably say, this guy's pretty smart, right? That is what, I mean, nice strategy. We would put him on the cover of Money Magazine. We put him on the speaking tour. We would all read his book and like learn principles for how to handle our own finances. Let's be like the rich guy who built the bigger barns, right? Let's, let's kind of, you know, follow his example. And really, this would be a great approach if, It'd be a great approach if there weren't an eternal dimension to consider. The man thought to himself, you know, I've got a long life left. got a lot of money left. I'm going to store it up. And I'm going to live easy. Great plan if all there is to this life is this life. But Jesus goes on in, in verse 20 to say, but God. And that's where everyone's like, oh, time out, time out. Okay, why do we got to bring God into this? This is a great story. I mean, this is a great story so far. It's a great story of success. This guy is like, you know, uh, the poster child for like consumerism and American capitalism. This guy's doing great. Why do we bring, why do we got to mix God and business and bring God into money? Why do we have to do that? Well, Jesus says, but God, because here comes God in the middle of this financial story of plenty. Because there is a reality that this guy is missing at his own peril. Jesus says, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? You fool. Wow. Those are harsh words coming from God. I don't think anybody ever wants to hear that from God. You fool. Let's be really clear, though, why God is calling this man a fool. He's not calling him a fool because he's blessed. He's not calling him a fool because he's wealthy. God was the one who blessed him with the wealth. God was the one who made his crops produce an abundant harvest. God was the one who blessed him. So this is not about, you know, whether we're good or bad based on how much money we do or don't have. God is the source of blessing. This isn't about having guilt because I have a lot or because God has blessed me with a lot. I mean, this, it's not about that at all. This guy's not a fool because he has a lot. This guy is a fool because he thought all of it was for his own consumption and that he would have plenty of life left to be able to spend it on himself. He was a fool because he forgot that there was an eternal dimension also to the way that we live. He was a fool because he realized that life is uncertain and that that very light night he would die. God calls a man a fool for these reasons. And, and, and what's really foolish is that now that he dies, all of his wealth is going to pass to somebody else. Someone else is going to get all that extra that he had. But he would miss all the joy in giving it away. He could have had a blast giving it away. But now it's all going to pass to somebody else, not because this guy was generous, but just because he had died. Right? That's why he was foolish. Like Charles Finney said, it's a lot more fun to give it away while you're alive than when you're dead. Now understand, I don't believe that Jesus is saying here that the guy died because he was a fool or because of the way he was handling finances. I don't think there's a connection there. I think he, Jesus is just saying, you know what, is this, time, this guy's time to go? He didn't know it. And he went and he was a fool because he had mismanaged his money. What should he have been doing? Well, verse 21, Jesus tells us, this is how it will be with anyone who stores a thing for himself, but is not rich toward God. That's kind of another scary statement. Wow. Are you, what, so what Jesus is saying is, this is how it's going to be, you fool, with anyone, or should, we could say, for everyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Now, that statement has two parts, and we have to put them together. Storing up things for ourselves and not being rich toward God. So Jesus isn't saying don't save, don't store up things. There's certainly a place for that. But if you're not also being rich toward God, therefore, then you will be called a fool in how you handled what God has given you, the extra that God has given you. That, that, that's, so God's economy what we're learning here is, is different from our economy. God views money different from how we view money. What do we do with extra? 
Well, we would say, well, I'm going to go from the Buick to the BMW, from the three, three car garage to the five car garage, or you know, from the condo to the, the bigger house. We see it as being used for us, but God would say, no, the reason I'm giving you extra is that, so that you could be a channel of blessing for others, so that the gospel could be proclaimed around the world, so that 20% of the world's population that's living on the brink of starvation can kind of come a little farther away from that brink and live a little bit better life, that there could be equal distribution of what I'm giving you, that you could be that conduit. And this is why Jesus would tell the rich young ruler, sell your possessions and give to the poor. It's going to be this great adventure. This is why John the Baptist said, you want to really live a righteous life? If you've got two tunics, give one to the guy who doesn't have a tunic at all. Or why Zacchaeus, when he came to faith, said, I'm now going to give away half of everything that I have. Demonstrating that faith had indeed come to his heart. Listen, um, Jesus is telling us, don't just store up things for yourself, but be rich toward God. Well, what does it mean to be rich toward God? How, do, how, how am I rich toward God? Well, I mean, we've already talked about the fact that God says, set aside a portion of your income. Be a percentage liver and a percentage giver. Live on a portion less than 100% and then give the rest away. Think of ways that you can give that away to kingdom work. Jesus will tell us other ways to be rich uh, toward God just in a few more verses. Verse 33, he says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. So Jesus says, by selling our possessions and giving to the poor, we're actually making an investment that will never depreciate. We're investing in a market that will never have a bear market, right? This is an eternally lasting investment that we're able to make. We're like, sell my possessions and give to the poor. Like, how would I even do that? And there was a time we would wonder, how would I do that? But now we have like eBay and like Facebook Marketplace. What would happen if all of us just went home and got all of our extra stuff, stuff that's sitting in storage, stuff that's sitting in our basement, stuff that's in our garage, stuff that we haven't used in like over a year, and just started like selling stuff, and, and then just saying, all right, I'm just going to give it all away to the poor, our organizations that are helping the poor. What kind of, of difference would we be able to make if we just got rid of the stuff that we don't even use, and just sold it? But then Jesus really gets to, to the final point, in the very next verse where he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is saying, you know what, I don't, I don't want your stuff. I don't need your money. I just want your heart. And it's really hard to get the heart, hard to get the heart of rich people. Right? That, that when you're rich and you have so much, you don't have to trust God the way you do when you're living meal to meal. That, that when you're rich, it's really hard to love God as much as you love your stuff. It's hard to get the heart of rich people. And the tendency is that our stuff kind of gets a grip on us. And, and we worry about our stuff. And we try to protect our stuff. And, and we feel secure because of our stuff. And so God, in order to get our hearts, wants us to loosen our grip on our stuff so that our stuff can loosen its grip on us. You know, when we live generously, when we see ourselves as these channels of blessing to others, it really leads to a better story and to a better life. I mean, wouldn't this have been a much better story if it had ended differently? Can you just imagine it? There was a certain rich man whose crops produced an abundant harvest. And the rich man said to himself, what will I do with all of this excess? The barns that I already have are already full. And he looked around him and he saw all these people who had tremendous need. And he said, I know what I'll do. I'm going to figure out a way to give this out to people around me who need it more than I do. And he had a blast doing it. And his family had a blast doing it. And that night, he died. And as he stood before the throne of God, God said to him, well done good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with the worldly wealth that I have given you. Now enter into your reward. You know, being rich toward God is the best story to live, the best way to live. And this is what, what Charles Finney told his friend Bill Gates when he's explaining why Bill should also give. He said this, the process of 
And most importantly, the results from granting this wealth to good causes has been a rich source of joy and satisfaction to me and for my family. The challenges, even setbacks I have experienced in my decades of personal engagement and generosity pale in comparison to the impact and deep personal satisfaction. What a story. Now, I hesitate in using his story because he's like, he gave $8 billion away. And we can't even relate to that, right? We can't. But we can all learn the lesson, not only of the rich fool, but also of Charles Finney. That the purpose of the extra that God gives us is always to be generous, to be open-handed, to be a channel of blessing for others. And when we do that, we take hold of the life that is really life. Would you just bow your heads with me as we just ponder this? Our Father in heaven, we just invite you through your spirit to search our hearts because we're all at different places with this. But Father God, I believe that according to the teaching of Jesus, you would want every one of us to consider this question. That if we were to die tonight, would we hear you fool, or would we hear well done based on how we are handling the extra you've given us? And we want to pray, God, that you would just tell us through your spirit what you would have us do to continue on the path, to change our path, to do something differently. Just convict us and then give us the courage to do it no matter what it is. May we, Father, live good stories, open-handed, generous, channels of blessing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.